there are funds out there that will come in with some additional capital, whether that's you know a short term second lien, a long term second lien, a JV, whatever that may be, cover that gap for you. Uh, outlined whatever return metric they need to kind of weather the storm. So, you know, are people going to default? Probably. There will be some some blood in the water, as they say. There's going to be some folks having to sell at a level that they weren't prepared for. You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Kerry Lutz. Well, hey, we've got a new guest on and you're going to want to hear him, his views, Colby Colbertson, because uh, he's in the space that actually finances investors in real estate. We want to get your take, Colby, you first welcome to to the show, but uh, get your take on what's happening now with uh with the uh the whole space uh you know, banks uh banks that we're in the midst of a banking crisis regardless what anybody says. And the question is uh how do you raise capital now? You can't just go to your local uh, bank and just sign up and uh, sure. give them some uh, documentation and uh, get a loan. It's a little more complicated than that now, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, it is. So, yeah, I appreciate you taking some time and having me on, Carrie. And uh, we're looking forward to kind of chat a little bit more about what we're seeing in the market. You know, obviously, from a macro level, just like you said, the bank crisis is affecting a lot of investors out there. Um, you know, ultimately because of where rates are today, obviously with the increase in say the 10 year treasury is compressing a lot of the underwriting, which, you know, when your rates are going out of whack, it's inevitably going to cause the speculation on values as well. Right. So when right. people are coming up on maturities or, or even acquisitions, leverage is going to be ultimately affected. Um, which is going to have a lot of people having some heartburn in the upcoming year. Oh, I'm sure of that, right? I mean, uh, yes, sir. definitely. So uh, are we going to see defaults as a result of what's happening uh, in the banking sector? You know, it's, it's really going to depend on how the investors, how they, how they maneuver. You know, when that scenario comes up, default is obviously an option. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of strategy that you could go into, you know, cash and refinances, is something that we're seeing a lot in the marketplace. For example, if you were to refinance at whatever leverage you're able to get to carry, there are funds out there that will come in with some additional capital, whether that's you know a short-term second lien, a long-term second lien, a JV, whatever that may be, cover that gap for you, uh, outlined whatever return metric they need to kind of weather the storm. So. You know, are people going to default? Probably. There will be some some blood in the water, as they say. There's going to be some folks having to sell at a level that they weren't prepared for. Um, but if they're strategic, there are some. There's capital out there that's designed specifically for coming in with the extra dollars that uh, that they need at the closing table to avoid the defaults. Okay, so obviously, when money becomes more scarce, lending standards go up, right? Sure. Uh, that's actually a really good point. You know, there was a time, call it two or three years ago, when you could go in and get 80% leverage, probably the best rate you possibly could. You didn't have to do too much analysis because everything was linear, right? Everything was just going up. Those mm -hmm. days are behind us. So now they're going to want to understand what your background is. What kind of management strategies have you gone full cycle with? What do you anticipate to you know, how do you anticipate to operate the building? What does your liquidity look like? Not just today, but post-close, as they say. So, you know, the days of 5% post-close liquidity are likely behind us, Carrie. Honestly, I think that they're going to be a little bit more conservative on who they let in the door going forward. Okay. So, um, more, um, more this, uh, I guess we should say, uh, standards are increasing, they're tightening. And uh, so is that going to mean that the uh, 
the promoter of the deal, the developer, has got to put more cash into it, more skin in the game? I would say that's a pretty good assumption, Kerry. You know, obviously, there's a lot of different ways to get deals done in this market, whether that's JVs, you know, creative family office money that's available to them as PREF or MES or whatever that may be. But there is a good um, moving average at the moment around, say, 65% LTV, which most investors are used to, say, 75, which I think that's a good benchmark that most folks are used to hearing. But now, right. say, 65%. If you're doing a million dollar deal, that's not too much. You know, you're probably talking about a difference of 100, 200 grand. But when you're talking about maybe some of the larger properties, that's five, 10, 15 plus, that difference of 65 and 75 percent, you're talking about a pretty significant swing. So, with that said, coming in with very sound underwriting, being organized with your documents, updated personal financial statements, schedule of real estate, pro forma plans. All of those are going to be attributes that are going to make your argument just a little bit better when you're uh, when you're you know pleading for more dollars at the closing table. Right. So so you're going to have to be a lot more astute and sure. really have your act together, right? Yes, sir. When you go now, these non-traditional type lenders like family offices mm -hmm. are they in a position to take up the slack from the uh, banking? Uh, banking sector from its vacating a lot of these uh a lot of these opportunities so that that's a good point and there's there's a few different ways i could take that terry and you know obviously working with a guy like myself that's you know not necessarily married to any capacity of debt we work with debt funds cmbs agencies family offices uh, just a myriad of different types of capital out there all of which kind of have their own positives and negatives there's some debt funds out there that are getting much more aggressive than banks are. You know, these folks have been doing this much longer than you and I have and have seen it ups and downs. So there are some lending institutions that could get more aggressive on the leverage. However, you know, it's a give and take in this world. You can get more leverage, but you're going to pay for it with a higher rate. You're likely going to get locked in with some kind of yield, yield maintenance or some type of debt yield requirement. So that way, they, they know that they're making the money they need to in order to distribute right. that capital. So there are, uh, you know, there's organizations out there that can get more aggressive. Even if your bank ultimately is coming in lower, there are also forms of capital that can come in as a second position to to fill that gap. Yeah. So you think this uh, is all temporary here or has the market fundamentally changed? And it's never going back to the way it was just uh, a year ago. You know, I think there's points to be made for both sides of that. Are we going to go back to 3% raise? Probably not, at least not, you know, for the foreseeable future. Not in our lifetime, in my opinion. Is he going to stay the same? No. You know, the, the, the economy's already slowed. They've already shown indication that they could potentially pause hikes. They may just stay where we're at for a little bit longer as opposed to um, providing more strain on the economy. So I think what happens from here, Carrie, is a level of silence uh, from the feds probably until, you know, say this time next year. Election year is going to be a big factor. You know, everybody wants to talk about the feds and where rates are going. I think the, the leading indicator of what happens next is ultimately what happens in November next year. Really think that it's all about the election? Yeah. Well, I think there's a big part of it, you know, because I think, you know, not to get into political views here, but let's all pray for red. I'll say that, um, you know, with what the Republicans right. coming in. And this is a family show. We don't talk about politics here. Plus, our uh, digital overlords tend to not like what uh, what I say. So um, <laughs> about virtually anything for that matter, if you know what I'm right. saying here, we got to talk in a little code here. Uh, yeah. I think the algorithm now understands pig Latin, so that's the only other out language that we could speak in that I know. Uh, but yeah, so it's not here. Here's what I mean by that, Carrie. So next year during during say campaigning, you're going to hear this a lot. For the people, we are going to lower rates. For the people, we're going to, you know, do whatever you know, whatever it is to help you buy a home. But you know, different really different true. things like that. That's and his his story is really speaking. Historically speaking, yeah. Kerry, every election year, typically rates get dropped by about 400 basis points. So it's, yeah. 
it's something that uh, it's something that I think will happen. It's just a matter of time and how it's going to be done. You just reminded me of something. I once saw it in Barron's. They're talking. It was election time. Don't even ask me who they were talking about. But they said the Federal Reserve is doing what it does best, and that's getting a president elected. Yeah, no kidding. We're about to see that firsthand, Gary. Yeah, you really think so? Because on the one hand, you know, uh, as a trader, I uh, I interview extensively Nick Santiago, and he says as long as the two year is pushing up against the Fed funds rate, they will keep raising interest rates. And then there's the contrary view, which believes that, uh, hey, uh, when they get desperate enough, the economy is the economy stupid. When it gets bad enough, they'll have no choice but to cut rates. So you're in the uh, latter, not the former camp. Well, the two year right now is at about five point one percent, which you know, obviously, is... to be exact. But yeah, you're close enough <laughs> on the two year treasury. Uh. Yeah, the two-year note, yeah, 515 today. It's up six basis points. But, and, and I should mention, as long as I'm saying it's October 2nd, first trading day of the month, it just went up six points. But, you know, that was as of a couple of hours ago. I haven't checked it, so you might be closer to it than me. If you've got it on your screen, tell us what you got. Yeah, no, mine, mine's actually from Chatham, which they're great. I follow them religiously. They are, they're published two hours behind. So what you're seeing may be, may be more accurate, uh, which yes. that's also a pretty good uh, gut punch. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I think just the only reason is because of so much default that we're seeing from the banks, the institutions, Sure, you know, by increasing rates or even just staying where we're at, it, it's almost like how much blood do you want to see? You know, the economy is a slowed. Transactions have, have slowed. Transaction volume has slowed. Value, you know, future value, uh, speculation has ultimately, um, you know, induced in the marketplace. So mm-hmm. I think all the objectives that they were looking for have taken place. So you know, now what? Do you just want to see people kind of be uncomfortable? Like there's got to be some type of recourse back to normalcy. Which I think, you know, another point that you made before is is going to go back to normal reality and historically speaking you know rates were somewhere like in the high fours low fives so we're not too far off realistically i think that we were kind of spoiled with the utopia for a little while all at you know 2019 through right. early 2021 but at the outside of those parameters carry if i were to get you a rate back in say 2018 at 4.85 or even five percent we're playing ball if I was in 2020 and I brought you a 4.85 percent, I would be laughed at. You know, people were fixing yeah. rates at three percent. That's why everybody's assuming notes these days. You know, so. Hey, so you live and die by the credit markets, obviously, and uh, your whole business and whether you do any deals or not, predicated upon those rates, right? So, um, but, and. I agree with you. My belief is that uh, that they will cut rates because uh, you know we all know who the Fed wants to get reelected, and uh, you know what they're about. On the other hand, the dollar is getting stronger, which doesn't portend well for rates. Uh, I- generally, when uh, Republicans get elected, the dollar sinks. And when Democrats get elected, the dollar goes up, and it has nothing to do with the soundness of the economic policies they pursue. It's all about, uh, you know, it's just all about the results of those policies. Uh, so, um, yeah, but being a betting man, I wouldn't bet against you, but I'm just not sure. I'm not sure it's in the bag yet. Uh, you know, we got so many uh, macro trends taking place now. Hey, so we, what sector of your business is the busiest right now in terms of getting obtaining financing uh, for your clients? I would say right now we're seeing a lot of owner user assets getting done, and I think that's because they don't ultimately rely on the leases, which is you know it's it's a fixed product. 
um, with owner user, like say car washes, RV park, yeah. hotels, when it's very operationally intensive from an income perspective, um, you're able to kind of tweak some of the numbers to where you could offset any uh, losses or deficits you're seeing in the marketplace with cost overrun or labor shortages, whatever it may be. But what you're not going to do is limit your income potential based on a lease that's in place. You know, if a rate goes up and you still have a lease that's here and you're in a fixed rate, you know, ultimately you could find yourself underwater. Whereas with owner user, when you can ultimately start pushing more business, do some more marketing, increase your cost of goods or your whatever that may be, we're seeing a lot more people uh, flock to those asset classes and lenders are very receptive as well because they're also getting operating accounts. You know, banks right now, as you've seen, um, they're very, you know, it's a yield star market, liquidity star market because, you know, people are pulling their money out of banks and putting them in CDs, make it five and a half percent. You know, so yeah. banks right now are really looking for, uh, you know, strong operators and they can find that with owner user assets. Okay. Gotcha. Office buildings still uh, dead in the water, huh? I, I think that office buildings are always going to have a place as long as it, it, it's not so, you know, it's not just like dead space, you know, like your example, the Bank of America building. I don't know what's happening above floor 55, you know what I mean? On a hundred and fifty floor a facility. Yeah, you know, I think neighborhood office when there's five, six, you know, maybe even 10 tenants, that could make a lot of sense because a lot of folks don't really enjoy working from home. Productivity sometimes can decline. Not everybody, it's not for everybody, you know? So I think if there's a place to have a quiet, safe place to go work nearby, you know, within 30 minutes of, of a commute, I think those places will continue to succeed. Um, but yeah, like I said, some of the larger institutional office buildings, you're seeing a lot of them get converted. You know, you're seeing a lot of those those buildings get converted into multifamily or a mixed use of some kind. You know, the full utilization of office, I think, is I'm not going to say so, a thing of the past, but it's going to be a while. So hard to convert many of those newer office buildings because the things that made them most attractive as office buildings, which is like um, small core at the middle, large uninterrupted spaces, no beams, yeah, make it a large distance from the elevator core to the uh, windows, make uh, a residential conversion very tough. The older buildings, like in Manhattan, yep. were actually perfect for the purpose. So, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I agree with you. They're going to have to convert them because I do think fundamentally the office uh, market and the way we work, uh, you know, wasn't changed by the uh, by the pandemic, but it was um, accelerated rapidly. Accelerated. Uh, Zoom wouldn't be uh, a third the company it is today without what happened during the pandemic, right? Oh yeah, I mean the their prices skyrocketed. I believe it like like five x or something like that. I mean, it's yeah. something remarkable. Yeah, pretty incredible. But uh, but you know, uh, it was it was going to happen. It just wasn't going to happen when it did, <laughs> right? As quickly as it did. I guess yeah, I'll tell you another aspect carried to that. Just to your point, is uh, the cost of infrastructure to make it sustainable for you know actual habitation towards oh. it's livable. You know, oh. think about the plumbing, the electric electricity. I mean, it's not just putting walls in, you know, you're talking about individual homes with individual piping, um, oh, yeah. know, electric, the list goes on and on and on. So, I mean, you can't really believe in that project, you know, for them to start making those types of leaps to your point. Or you got to have some serious, uh, government backing. Hey, one other question Are you into, uh, uh, clean energy projects because that figures into real estate dramatically. Things like microgrids, like mm -hmm. uh, you know, re renovating buildings to make them more energy efficient. All those things mm -hmm. is that something you're seeing an increase in? I am actually. There, there's there's government regulated pro uh, regulated programs out there, Gary, that would ultimately give you a ton of tax benefits. You know, they'll do, you know, green efficient window panes, you know, roof lining, whatever it may be, plumbing, low flow toilets, 
uh, LED lighting. There's there's just a list goes on and on and on. Here's the thing: a lot of those have to come in as a as a tax lien. Some of them see them as like second position. So yeah. um, when I say them, lenders aren't always kosher with having that type of lien, which they're in first they're in first position. Um, the the government is. So it gets a little bit dicey sometimes. There are, there's a ton of different lenders that are outspoken positively about using those, but there's also other lenders out there that are like, hey, I'll just give you the extra leverage. You know, let's not muddy the water on the liens because if something were to happen, something goes awry, who's paying first? You know, so those those conversations come up pretty often. But to answer your question in short, there is a ton of uh, green efficient programs that are out there uh, in today's market. Right. All right. Hey, I think we covered a lot for one uh, session and I'll let you guys out there, uh, let that sink in for a bit. If you got any questions or comments, shoot me an email, klcarrylutz.com. Colby, uh, where do we find you on the web? How do we connect with you? Yeah, the best way to reach me is my is my email. It'd be cc at colbertsonholdings.com. And LinkedIn is the best way to reach me. I, I don't have a website because I just, I, I don't feel like I need, but I'm independent. Um, but LinkedIn's a great way to reach me in my email. So if you reach me there, I'll be uh, more than happy to connect with anybody looking for capital arrangements or investment opportunities. All right, you got it. We'll put your LinkedIn in the show notes to this interview on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. You click through and send Colby an email if you want. A, and while you're there, sign up for your free newsletter. Questions, comments, shoot me an email, kl at kerrylutz.com. We'll get you an answer quick. Colby, appreciate you stopping by. We'll talk to you again. Thanks, Kerry. Thanks for listening to Kerry Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.